Today on Tech News Weekly, I'm Ant Pruitt, and I'm hanging out with Mr. Jason Howard for the week. Uh, this week, we're going to take a look at some VR news from the folks at Meta in that Meta Quest Pro device. Hmm, just how good is it? Also, CNN has ended its NFT project. What does that even mean? And lastly, Google is working on yet another cool project that they're probably going to kill in the future. That's coming up. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 256, recorded Thursday, October 13th, 2022. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Wealthfront. Visit wealthfront.com slash twit to get started and get your free $50 bonus with an initial deposit of $500. That's wealthfront.com slash twit. And by Collide. You can meet your security goals and pass your order without compromising on privacy. Visit collide.com slash TNW to find out how. If you follow that link, they'll hook you up with a goodie bag, including a t-shirt, just for activating a free trial. And by Nureva. Nureva has simplified everything about meetings and classroom audio. You get great audio in systems that are easy to install and manage. Visit Nureva.com slash twit and get 50% off one Nureva HDL 300 system for mid-sized rooms when you get a live online demo and buy before December 16th, 2022. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is the show where we talk to people who are making and breaking the tech news. I'm back. I'm Jason Howell. It's good to be here. And joining me is... I'm Ant Pruitt. Yeah, Ant. How you doing, man? <laughs> oh, I'm unbelievable as always, sir. How about yourself? I'm, I'm just I'm... trying to, to settle in into this news role because you and Mr. Sergeant, <laughs> you, you do this so daggum well, and I'm just sitting here shaking in my boots, brother. Uh, well, you're not showing it. You're always <laughs> solid when you when you step in for Micah. Micah, of course, is out this week. And then also, actually, he's out next week. Next week, you're going to get a solo Jason uh, doing the show. So we're probably going to have a few extra interviews booked for next week. But uh, but yeah. I love doing this show with you, Ant, so it's great to have you here. It's good to see your face. And uh, mm-hmm. why don't why don't we get right in? Um, we're going to have some interviews in about 15 minutes. Those interviews are going to start. We had to shuffle things around. So I'm going to start with my story of the week. If you haven't started thinking about the holidays, uh, yeah, I suppose it's about time. Where I'm at right now, it's feeling very fall-like weather outside, starting to think about, oh, no, Christmas is right around the corner. Got to start shopping. But this is a weird year, right? Like, everything is is transitioning right now. Uh, there's inflation, undeniably so. There's this looming recession, a lot of fear around recession. Interest rates are going bananas. All are really going to impact how we shop for the holidays, what we choose to spend our money on. There's a few things that are kind of happening right now that I thought I'd highlight in my story of the week. First of all, Adobe released its holiday forecast for online consumer spending. They actually determined, and I thought this was uh, surprising, I thought, you know, for sure, you know, spending is going to go way, way down. Uh, and it is going down from last year. Last, saw, last year saw a growth of 8.6% of, uh, of con- online consumer spending. This year, they say it's still going to be up. Uh, for, well, I mean, it's, it's still going to be in the positive. 2.5% uh, increase in online consumer spending, not quite 86 So it has, you know, slowing in their in their estimation, but still mm-hmm. um, kind of ahead. Adobe is projecting that consumers are going to shop earlier this year. Uh, in-person shopping is going to be impacted. More of those sales moving online as a result. And uh, I don't know if you and have partaken in any of the you know last few days of Amazon's Prime early access sale, but this kind of seem they seem to kind of correlate to the same information, right? Adobe's saying consumers are going to be worried about waiting until the end of the year to do their shopping. Mm-hmm. They're going to, and and companies like Amazon are going to capitalize off of this by offering steep discounts early. So what did we have this year? We had Amazon holding its second. It's this is the first time that it's held its second Prime uh, sale, uh, Prime Day event. Let's call it. It was two days yesterday mm-hmm. and the day before. And uh, I, I don't know. I've, I've been very out of touch with tech the last couple of weeks. Did you get in on any of these sales? And was there a reason if you did? 
Well, when you presented this article, I, I found it quite interesting because number one is like, okay, Amazon must be looking at the same data that Adobe's looking at because yeah. why would they decide to do a second Prime Day event here in the same year? And um, sure enough, it, it went off without a hitch for them, apparently. Not necessarily things that I wanted to buy, but there was a lot of stuff out there being offered up these last two yeah. days. Um, as far as the spending you know, it's not as it's not as big an increase as Adobe mentioned, but it's still an increase. That says a lot. That says that there's people out there still willing to sacrifice a little bit for their loved ones or just try to pick up some deals where they can because this recession is it's not going anywhere, dude. This this inflation is still a mess, it's still hurting people's pockets. And if you can go ahead and get it in right now, prior to the holiday season, just just go ahead and get it and, and lock things away. So you sort of secure when the holiday season comes around and not having all of that stress hanging over the top of your head of, oh boy, I need I need to get something for my for my loved ones right now, but I, I really can't. You know, I don't want to be in that position. Um, and I'm sure other folks don't want to be in that position. Yeah, and a lot of people are going to be in that position. And I think maybe maybe part of this kind of early strategy of Amazon, and maybe we'll see this from other online uh, retailers, it's it's almost like snapping people out of the the habit or the, or out of what they think is uh, is you know going to hurt them later, right? Like everybody already has c- Christmas spending on the mind, and it's like, well, mm-hmm. everything's changed in the economy right now. Are we even going? You know, are we going to be able to put you know uh, presents under the tree the way we're used to? Are we going to be able to spend? No, we're already worried about that. But having an early sale like an Amazon Prime mm-hmm. Day, like happened you know just a couple of days ago, it's outside of the habits of people, and so it mm-hmm. becomes more of like a knee jerk, like, oh wait a minute, I didn't realize that thing is on sale right now at Amazon. I better jump on it, you know, as opposed to waiting mm-hmm. until the end of the year when everybody's already decided. No, we've really tightened things up. I don't know if that's that's you know what's the factor here. One thing to note, and I thought this was really interesting, is that uh, back in 2020, you may remember Amazon delayed Prime Day, and that ended up happening in October, which is where we're at right now. That mm-hmm. led to an increase of 44 percent year over year, um, a, an increase in e-commerce growth that year. So there was something to that. It's it's almost like uh, I imagine yeah, Amazon did that, and they were a like, whole "Whoa, different year, though, Mister Mr. Yeah. Howell." It, it was just, sure. it was not like any other year. Everything seemed to have a big pivot that year. Yeah. Um, oh, for everything sure. Everything just went to online. You know, they mentioned the the lack or decrease in in person sales. Uh, that makes total sense because right now you go out and about to different stores. There's hardly anyone working the cash registers anymore. So people are, are more apt to just go ahead and place their orders online because of flat out service, not necessarily because of something that they need. It's just a faster speed of service. Yeah. Yeah. No, no question. I mean, that was a weird year. Um, and and it was very, uh, you know, a lot of question marks as far as like how things were going to settle in the end of the year. And I think things did, I mean, surprisingly well, considering just how upside down everything turned, but we're kind of in our own weird year right now with, mm-hmm. you know, like with all the factors that we're talking about as well. So I could see Amazon saying, well, it worked for that playbook. Will it work for this one? And, uh, you know, I, I suppose, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know what the, the end result was from the last couple of prime days. If it, you know, uh, beat, Amazon's traditional Prime Day from the summertime, uh, mm-hmm. how it compares to what they expect to do on, uh, you know, Cyber Monday and those those uh, kind of shopping holidays. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I guess that remains to be seen. I'm sure over the course of the next week or two, we'll start to get more information as far as how successful it was, and that will determine if we see it next year because this might be part of their permanent playbook. Now, Mr. Howell, did you see anything from the competition? Because in the past, Target and Walmart would do pretty much similar events um, online, have their own bit of a prime day or max Mm -hmm. special day. Um, It's pretty much limited to online services. I didn't see anything like that. And I would like to assume that again, especially Walmart had all of this data in front of them to sort of Mm -hmm. cherry pick when is a prime time, no pun intended, to figure out when to um, do a sale and try to compete with the likes of Amazon and be able to get those extra bits of revenue coming in from the consumers. Did you see anything like that? Cause I didn't. 
You know, I didn't see anything bubble up like specifically where it was unavoidable. But as Scooter X and Chad is pointing out, we've seen this the, the the previous you know couple of years. Black Friday as an event is ha- is creeping backwards more and more. Target right now is having you know kind of Black Friday sales. Like, what do you define as a sale that qualifies as a competitor to what Amazon did? And I think they're yeah. all kind of doing that now. They're all saying, you know what? It's not just about the last. Uh, month leading up to Christmas where people are doing their shopping the way it used to. It's kind of the last quarter of the year is all (laughs) shopping. And uh, you know what I mean? People are scaling it back. Gives them more time to really actually uh, feel like they've found the right deal instead of being pigeonholed into this one day, this Black Friday shopping event. And uh, and there, it's almost like they're all like trying to beat each other on the time. You know, one moves back, the other says, "Oh yeah, well, uh, my Black Friday event is three days before yours." And you know, at, at some point, it's just going to be the entire. It's like Black Year <laughs> instead of you Black know, Friday. It's just Black Year. You know what's crazy is I'm I can. There's a part of me that 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 the old man side is coming out. It's like. Yeah. Dude, we haven't even had daggum Halloween yet. Why are we talking about Christmas shopping and holiday shopping, right? You know, it's, it's not even the 31st of October. But again, at the same time, the more pragmatic side of me that says, you know what, people's budgets aren't the same this year. And maybe this is an opportunity to go ahead and, you know, get things sooner and have that just that stress just lifted. I don't know. Yeah. It, yep. It's crazy. Uh, you things know, are getting earlier and earlier. Oh. Totally. It is. It is. Earlier and earlier. And I think, you know, to kind of wrap this story up and then we can uh, move on. Adobe also said that shoppers are going to continue seeing larger discounts than normal this time around, which when you think about it kind of makes sense, right? Like on one hand, the economy is so upside down. uh, So you would think like, oh, well, why would companies discount their products? But the, the companies still want to move these products as best as they can. The dollar is literally more expensive now than it was a year ago. And so that would require steeper discounts to lure people over. So Adobe was saying 27% markdowns are expected in electronics, toys, down, uh, markdowns of up to 22% expected. This is from 8% last year in electronics and 9% toys last year. So big differences there. If you're searching for a, and I'm going to put it in air quotes, a deal, <laughs> Adobe says you're going to find better deals now. But At the same time, the overall cost of all this stuff has gone up anyways. So are we just getting back down to normal? You know what I mean? It's kind of like fudging the math to make it look like it's really great. But um, I would say, you know, really do your homework to know whether you're actually getting a deal. Because sometimes these companies, Amazon included, make it seem like you're getting an amazing deal. But if you go historically, if you go to Camel, 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 and you do a search for that product to see historically where it's at, you're like, oh, that's just a deal from where the price was was set five months ago not a deal historically mm-hmm. you know what i mean mm-hmm. it's so sad so. It, it, it's almost scammy but again that's that's the capitalist world we live in <laughs> that's right capitalism it's working <laughs> all right uh coming up nft fallout continues and is going to uh, have an awesome interview on that but first Uh, Let's take a break. Thank the sponsor of this episode of Tech News Weekly. This episode is brought to you by Wealthfront. Wealthfront's goal is to make building long-term wealth easy, uh, offering both high-yield savings and automated investing accounts that do just that, all within a beautifully designed interface. So, you know, take a look at your bank. Is your bank keeping money that could be yours? Well, if you're earning less than Wealthfront's 2.55% APY, uh, they just might be. Here's why. Federal interest rates have been going up this year, which we were just talking about this, which means banks have been earning more on your savings. Where's all that extra money going? Well, according to the FDIC, the average U.S. bank has only raised their rates to 0.17% this year, while Wealthfront is now offering their clients a rate that's about 15 times higher with the Wealthfront cash account. So don't, you know, let your bank keep the interest that you could be earning. Join nearly half a million people who already use Wealthfront to earn 15 times more than the average US bank. And it's super easy to sign up. Plus you're going to get unlimited transfers that are completely fee free, up to $1 million in FDIC insurance through partner banks as well. And there are no account fees, no minimum balance. And if you sign up at wealthfront.com slash twit, 
you actually get a free $50 bonus with an initial deposit of $500. Visit wealthfront.com slash twit. You can get started, get your free $50 bonus with an initial deposit of $500. Check it out. You're going to love it. That's wealthfront.com slash twit. This has been a paid endorsement for Wealthfront. We thank Wealthfront for their support of Tech News Weekly. All right, Ant, over to you. All right. So over the last two years or so, we've been discussing NFTs here at the Twit Network. Um, And me as a creative artist, I have been defending NFTs for the most part, (laughs) especially up against the likes of Mr. Laporte and Mr. Jeff Jarvis when we're on This Week in Google. But I can see why the masses have been a little bit against the idea of NFTs. Well, here recently, big old CNN has gotten into a little bit of hot water as it's been accused of what we call a quote unquote rug pull as it abandons its NFT project. So today we're going to be joined by the man that's quote, been in tech, been a tech blogger since before the word was invented and will never log off. I love that. I pulled that straight off of his bio. Mr. Richard Lawler of The Verge has covered this event um, dealing with the big media giant CNN. Mr. Richard, how you doing, sir? And welcome to Tech News Weekly. Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Um, but yes, uh, uh, I, I have I have been doing this for quite a while. And uh, t- N- NFTs are, are unlike anything I've ever seen before. <laughs> I appreciate you joining us today. This this story got my attention because it seems like um, a lot of the media companies, well, not just media companies, everybody seemed to jump on NFTs as, as like a fad, okay? And, and it, you had some people that were quite serious about it as an investment, but then all of a sudden you had the likes of Nike and NFL and NBA and CNN and everybody was doing NFTs. And I'm like, what are you talking about? This, this CNN... NFT project. What exactly did it entail? Because uh, I is it just pictures of, of of athletes? Is it news stories? How exactly did it work? So CNN launched this in uh, the summer of 2021. They had a apparently a six week internal kind of beta period, and then they launched it for the public. And their vault by CNN plan was to have tokens that they would release over time, kind of tied to big stories. Uh, some of them would mint. Uh, particular stories at at CNN or particular coverage. They also have an they also had an NFT for the launch of CNN Plus, which uh, I guess was a little bit more rare than they expected. Yeah. Um, and then uh, they they would have things for other news stories. They would also have like kind of artistic interpretations uh, of different news events. But it, the idea was they they had moments, just like the NBA Top Shot has moments that they sell where they're kind of digital trading cards. They were trying to do that for news events. Well. Why would someone assume that this this type of content is is has value like that far as someone wanting to contribute dollars to it and say that they have the rights to it? Or or am I totally confusing because I'm it CNN still has the rights to these stories. Right. Or or is it just owned by Joe Schmo that decides to spend? You you are you are exactly correct. Um, You have bought when you've bought one of these NFTs, you have bought. I'm not sure what, and I and I think that's the answer for why they didn't become more broadly popular, because no, you you don't own the the rights to the story or to the image or to be able to use it in kind of different places. You own a a digital collectible, sure, and and the the NFT token does ensure that you know, on the blockchain it's recorded as a unique entry. But what you actually have is 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 wildly unclear. I think to to kind of everyone. Um, and, and while while there are people who, who looked at these and said, yes, I would like to purchase these, I would like to collect them, it's not really enough or viable enough to, to build a business out of it. And, and I think that's what you're seeing from CNN now saying that, that they're shutting down the project. Now, there's a number that's been quoted in this story, uh, $300,000. Now, I could say $300,000 to people and they're like, "Woo, that's a lot of money. But in the bigger scheme of things, when you're talking about a big media conglomerate such as CNN, that's not a lot of money. Uh, allegedly, they collected or brought in at least $300,000 with this project. Now, where is that $300,000 going now that this project is is kaput? You know, are, are the people that, that minted out of their funds or what's the deal here? That's a, a very interesting question. Um, and, and they said in their discord, or at least the last time I checked, they were telling the people in their discord that they were going to refund them some of the value of their NFTs. And they had basically taken a snapshot on October 6th and it seemed like it would be about 20 percent. But that's just not much. And because of the nope. blockchain that they used, 
you would only you would only be able to like withdrawing money from it costs money like it, mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. um to, oh, to withdraw money to, to real that. money so it's possible <laughs> it's possible that even if they refund you something you might end up with functionally nothing because you can't withdraw it which chain which blockchain were they using do you know uh, they were using Flow, uh, Dapper Labs Flow, the same thing that uh, NBA Top Shot uh, uses and uh, NFL all day, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. You know, again, as a creative artist, I've, I've, I totally get the idea of NFTs because I like the idea of being able to provide another source of income for artists. Uh, it, it's, it's not easy to get out there and sell your work. And if this is another way to give you another revenue stream, I was totally for it. Unfortunately, it seemed to turn into a lot of other weird things instead of just another way for, for artists to get paid. And then you mentioned this this blockchain um, gas fees was just ridiculous, depending on where you had your items minted. So, again, three hundred thousand dollars for for CNN, someone trying to get a refund, they're probably going to pay a gas fee. <laughs> just to get their quote unquote refund from CNN and end up losing another 40% right out the gate. Does that sound about right here with flow versus something like that? I'm not sure that they have side. gas fees on flow. They, they have kind of a more standardized system mm-hmm. um, for, for their withdrawals. And, and it's supposed to be a, a more efficient blockchain, et cetera. It's, it's a, a bit newer than uh, you know, even Ethereum or, or Bitcoin or something uh, like that. But okay, because good. it's a, because it's kind of their own blockchain, you don't have necessarily all of the same options uh, for withdrawing. Like with with something else, you might have your choice of ways to get your money out. Even even if as as you mentioned, gas fees could eat up a lot of it. You you could wait. You could do different things. But with this, you just play by their rules. Now now with this project pretty much going away, uh, do you see a trend happening here? Do do you think NBA is going to take a look at this and say, you know what, it's not really working out for us? Or have you seen any data from the NBA or NFL with any of their projects with NFTs? I've asked um, a lot of the companies that have launched projects like Top Shot uh, all day, and I haven't been able to get a response from any of them about specifically how many people are, are active on, on these things. But you can take a look at the marketplaces and see that from where the prices were last year, where, where they kind of peaked in January of this year, everything is way down. The prices, the prices are way, way, way down. The number of act- active sellers, the number of transactions, all very much down. And when I go into the discords and into the Reddit conversations, all I see are people saying that they feel like they've been ripped off. And I <laughs> don't know how long these projects can keep going or if these brands will want to be attached to something that just isn't that popular. It's a, it's a very, very, very niche thing. Um, kind well, of, no matter how you feel about it, it's just a very niche uh, element. Well, we can also look at it as, you know, just the overall economy is pretty craptastic right now. This has nothing to do with it being on a blockchain or NFTs or what have you. It's just people's money's tight right now. So maybe that's why people aren't invested in these things. Um, it's not necessarily, I guess you can't always say it's a scam. It's probably just because People don't have the cash right now and don't want to. Well, I, I think that that's a, a massive part of it, um, just that people don't have that free cash flow. When, when you had all, all this inflation and, and everyday items became more expensive. I, I know me, I, I was looking at things that I was buying last year. And I was like, ah, you know, maybe, maybe I can't afford to, to pick up another one right now. I'll, I'll pass. And NFTs would probably be something that would be high on the list of, OK, I guess I can live without buying another one today. But I think the problem that they have is, is trying to grow the audience to right. the, uh, a, a large scale. And they've kind of, they seem to have hit the number of people who are very interested in participating in these marketplaces. You know, thinking about trying to grow the audience, CNN is, 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 ha, has been around forever, old school, if you will. Um, I, I guess that's part of the problem is, is, is CNN is needing to really target more of a younger generation. Is, is that what it is? Or is, or do you, think that the NFT market is geared towards people like us that's, you know, over 40 or, or what have you. One of the things that uh, has struck me as, as I've kind of gotten familiar with NFTs over the last year plus is that overwhelmingly the people who keep telling me that they're the future and that they're so cool and that they're so incredible, they are old like me. They have a hairline that is going back like mine. They have gray <laughs> hairs in their beard like I do. And every time I looked around for the young people that this is supposedly uh, appealing to, they were telling me that they don't like NFTs. 
It ah. would, because and I, and when I when I looked at it and I, I I tried to talk to as many people as many age groups as I can to get kind of input. The appeal of the financial aspect is is a, is the kind of long term financial idea that appeals to an old person, and you you know that we we, we might take a, a slightly different view of of how investments affect us because we know how long. <laughs> Uh, they can go. But when you're young, mm -hmm. it seems like you have forever. So like, why would you buy something based on what it might be worth later? It, right. just, it just doesn't right. really strike them that way. Right. Yeah. I, I Again, I, I always thought it was a generational thing. And I guess I was a, a little bit backwards on it. It's, it's my generation that's, that's touting this, not necessarily the young folks. Good grief. Well, Mr. Richard, this is this has been a fun conversation. I appreciate you coming out here to, to just shed some light on this story because, again, CNN is big. This is not just some rinky-dink company deciding to do NFTs and then they just stop it. This is pretty big. They're a big company, big business, make a lot of money throughout the year. And quite a few people were affected on this. I appreciate you shedding the light on this. Uh, where can we find you online and some of the other things that you're working on? Yes, of course, The Verge, always covering all of the news, uh, waiting to see whatever Elon is doing in the next five minutes. Because Oh, no, something. don't bring that name up. <laughs> <laughs> um, on Twitter, at RJCC. And, you know, yes, I'll be... Very interested to see what happens with these different NFT things. We've seen brands like Nike and Adidas. Uh, I'm watching a, a Gap Discord that is very, very uh, unsettled about how things are going. So, so I'm, 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 I'm interested. I don't know how much everyone else is. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating story in the end, one way or the or another. Thank you so much for hanging out with us, Mr. Richard. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, Mr. Howell has a great interview coming up because, again, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook and or is it Meta? Which one is it? They're, they're continuing to make some noise, especially when you start talking about the metaverse. But first, we're going to take a few minutes to thank another fine sponsor of Tech News Weekly. And that's the folks over at Collide. If you're listening to this podcast, the odds are good that at some point you'll go through an audit like SOC 2 or ISO 27001. And when you do, you have to answer some tough questions about endpoint security. Questions like, do all your company laptops have their disk encrypted? Does everyone have the company's password manager installed? Or do you have a system in place to monitor and maintain compliance throughout your cross-platform fleet? Well, OK, so I know you you twit folks and Tech News Weekly folks are pretty sharp. So even if you're confident in answering all of those questions with a big yes, the bigger question is, can you prove it to an auditor? Well, if you're not quite sure how you can go about proving this information uh, for compliance, you need to check out the folks at Collide. Collide is an endpoint security tool for Mac, Windows and Linux devices that does things MDMs just can't do and gives you the visibility you need to achieve uh, and maintain compliance. Best of all, Collide doesn't resort to surveilling on your employees or locking down their devices. Instead, it works with end users to resolve issues and relies on their cooperation and informed consent. You can meet your security goals and pass your audit without compromising privacy. Uh, visit collide.com slash TNW to find out how. If you follow that link, they'll hook you up with a goodie bag, including a T-shirt just for activating a free trial. That's collide.com slash T-N-W. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash T-N-W. And we thank Collide for their support of the show. All right. Um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about Meta, the Metaverse, Facebook, kind of not really about Facebook because that's not what they really focus on anymore these days. That vision has shifted so dramatically from what we've known Facebook to be, you know, the social media behemoth and in, like, what a change a year can make, right? Now Meta believes the future will be the metaverse, headset technology, different from the heads, from the, from the ear set that I'm wearing now, the full like immersive experience, virtualized experiences, uh, augmented reality, mixed reality, all that stuff. So all eyes were on the company this week to see how it's progressed in this year that followed last year's kind of 
reinvention of the company. And joining us to talk about some of the announcements at MetaConnect 2022 and how that whole metaverse thing is doing is Adi Robertson from The Verge. Welcome back to the show. It's good to see you. Yeah, hi. Hi, thanks for hopping on and taking a few minutes with us today. Really appreciate it. So, um, and we've got a lot of fun stuff to talk about because you did get to try the new hardware, but we're going to save that for a few minutes. Let's first talk a little bit about Zuckerberg's kind of pre-recorded keynote. And I also know that The Verge, you know, you had a you had an interview um, with Zuckerberg as well. But I think what people are trying to understand here is we're a year into this uh, this new direction and you know we're trying to understand what the company's vision on the metaverse is is in your mind is zuckerberg making a strong case a good view of what what they feel this metaverse kind of direction that they're paving the way for like is that working is he is he doing a good job of explaining at this point one year later what's going on it's hard for me to tell because on one hand if you are talking to me as a sort of consumer of technology and a tech reporter who is coming from a pretty sp specific perspective, this is not necessarily super compelling to me in a lot of ways. Yeah. But I think that a lot of what he's doing is trying to make a play for these really large businesses that can implement this stuff at a large scale. Um, like they brought up someone from Accenture uh, on to talk about all of the things that they can do with this headset. So. It seems possible that he's making a successful pitch to a group of people that just we don't associate with the traditional Facebook user base. But if we're talking about his goal is to get a billion people into VR and AR, I think this wasn't the strongest showing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and if that were to happen, boy, it feels like that's a very far distance uh, into the future before we get to that point, which I mean, Zuckerberg has said time and time again, you know, apparently he and uh, people who are behind him at Meta are willing to uh, to be with the discomfort of now the like collective confusion of wait a minute, what the heck are they doing again uh, to get to the point that they apparently have the vision for um, now Zuckerberg emphasized quality improvements for avatars things like legs you know that of course everybody you know looks at that they're like okay great avatars have legs but what else you know better rendering for facial expressions how important are these improvements to the success of this like wider vision? Like these are technological improvements and they're welcome, but I don't know, should Meta be focusing on, on other more important things to get more people on board? Or are these things essential in order to kind of get to that point? I don't know if I'd say essential, but I think that face and eye tracking actually is the kind of thing that smooths over one of these little uncanny points in VR where a thing where you can have these avatars and you have social experiences, but it's picking up facial expressions that sort of match yours and body language. I think that yeah. feels much more natural to people and makes it a little less than this kind of cartoony stiff thing that everyone's sort of spent a bunch of time making fun of Facebook and Meta for, uh, for having. Um, so I think that's useful. I think the issue right now is sort of that they are developing this technology and now they're at this point where it's still too expensive to work into a device that lots of people could buy, but it's not quite futuristic enough where you can look at this and go, oh, well, this is going to change everything. Right, right. Now, actually, um, before we get into the hardware, uh, which I'm super curious to hear about, one last question. You actually wrote uh, just recently, I saw this article this morning, about Zuckerberg's vision of openness around the metaverse. And... Uh, well, I, I think it's safe to say you didn't mince words in contrasting that with Apple and Microsoft and kind of their definitions of openness. I'm curious to kind of hear you talk a little bit about that, kind of set your set your uh, your opinion there uh, for listeners of yours. Yeah, so Mark Zuckerberg, this, the context is that he ended Connect by making this rousing speech about how we think the future of the metaverse should be open and interoperable and there should be lots of companies. And he did this by making this historical analogy where there's always been an open and a closed platform in computing. And in the 90s, Microsoft was open and Macintosh was closed. And then Android was open and the and iOS was closed. The thing he's clearly getting at is that Apple is rumored to be introducing a headset that's going to pretty directly compete with the Quest Pro. And he is very clearly setting up, well, there's Apple and it's the closed option and we're going to have the open option. But his version of open is just so reverse engineered 
toward that conclusion that it doesn't really make much sense to me. His bar is, do they make separate, like Microsoft was open because it made separate computers and chips and operating systems. And those things were all from different companies and it wasn't bundled into a single supply chain like Apple, which is just, I, I guess it's, it's not like a wrong definition of open, but it's not the thing that most people care about or that really particularly matters for most consumers. Like Microsoft had just tremendous amounts of power during this period and it was still a huge monopoly. So I just right. don't really see Meta offering a kind of meaningful openness with its announcements. Like, I want to be clear that they allow sideloading. I think that they are way more open than iOS in a lot of ways. Uh, it was just a strange statement. Yeah, yeah, fair. I totally agree. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about hardware. Um, you know, this is the stuff that's uh, that's maybe a little bit more exciting or maybe not. Uh, I mean, yes, exciting, but also when we're talking kind of like consumer interest, hardware goes a lot further than I think this like pie in the sky, like vision of what the metaverse could or could not be. And you actually had the, the chance to kind of check out uh, this headset, the uh, Meta Quest Pro. Um, so I guess describe a little bit your experience because this is, you know, this is a higher end, you know, higher price point device. This is, uh, from my perception anyways, it's not meant to be like, oh, I have the Quest 2 and I really want, you know, to kind of level up here. It really seems like they're maybe, uh, you know, arming this or, or pointing this towards different types of buyers, different types of users. What was your experience inside the head headset? What did you walk away from that experience uh, feeling about the project? I think that for one thing, it is if I could get it or a Quest 2, I would love a lot of these features. Just it's better balanced. It finally put the battery in the back like, you know, I mm. wished it would have ages ago. Yeah, um, no it's, So it's more ergonomic. It has uh, this kind of nice color pass through mode that does some interesting things with this pseudo AR. Um, the battery life much worse. But... And I think that also eye tracking and face tracking, I've explained why it's kind of cool. But I think it's mostly geared toward a different set of users just because they couldn't get the price down to a point where you would try to pitch it to any consumer. It's $1,500 compared to 400 for the Quest 2. $1,500 right now as well like you know it's Jeez. it's really unfortunate the timing right you know every everybody is getting more and more worried about spending money on practically anything and this just seems like a total luxury device um not many people have fifteen hundred dollars to throw around for a smartphone let alone you know the the headset that enables the next wave of uh of the metaverse whatever that may or may not be so it's a hard sell for now i think uh, yeah I, I would totally agree this really seems if if nothing else armed at a different subset of users you know the enterprise or whatever primarily because they're the ones that might actually be able to stomach spending that kind of money on a piece of hardware like this that makes me think right. of you know headsets like hololens like magic leap have you experienced i i imagine you know because you know so much about vr and and all uh, related um technologies that's why i love getting you on the show, how does this headset kind of compare in your limited time with it with things like HoloLens and Magic Leap? Does it have a like does it have an advantage over those or is it still catching up? So they're on a basic level of technologically completely different that uh, HoloLens and Magic Leap both use waveguides, which is you're actually seeing the real world, but there's stuff projected on top of it. Whereas Meta, it's going to give you this video feed of the world and then put virtual objects into that space, which means that it always kind of starts at a disadvantage from an AR point of view because you're not actually seeing the real world. I think that there is potentially good usefulness here because they have things like, say, a Microsoft partnership where you can have virtual screens with Office. And Meta is just a massive company that has a lot of resources to throw at this. But HoloLens and Magic Leap have also been trying to identify specific companies that need specific things and then tailor their devices toward them. And the Quest Pro seems much more like they just crammed as much futuristic stuff that they want in their next headset into this device. And now they hope that it's good for someone. Yeah, <laughs> they hope that it finds its users. I mean, no question. I'm curious to, to test this out. Leo has uh, ordered uh, the Quest Pro 
So I'm sure at some point I'm going to be able to strap one of these on my face and get a sense of, of exactly what it's all about and everything. I'm far less, I feel far less inclined to you know, spend my money on this headset without knowing a little bit more, without knowing exactly what it, what it brings from, a, from a, you know, a user standpoint. It kind of seems to me that I'm the I'm probably the kind of consumer, the kind of user that you know the quest, the 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 the, uh, the standard quest that I already have is probably good enough for what I'm using. But sounds interesting. Um, I, th I think finally let's let's uh, end with with this question, which is just more kind of you know taking a look at at everything you know that that Meta is doing and this evolving metaverse universe that all companies are kind of going in this direction. What's your take on whether this gamble that that Facebook slash Meta has uh, has made on whether this is going to pay off for them, given what we saw at this year's event? how much de uh, development we've seen in one year and like what does that mean about like where we might be two to three years from now are you optimistic i know you are, i know you're a fan of the technology because you cover it so passionately but are you optimistic with f uh, the, the fact that the company meta can do what they want to do successfully given what we know I am a huge fan of meta hardware because they're very, very good at buying hardware companies doing amazing things. So I'm genuinely really excited about some of their AR tech. They showed off this uh, electromyographic sort of not mind control, but very close wristband that they're hoping is a control system for future AR. I love that stuff. I think that if they pour a bunch of resources into Horizon, it has been a year or so. Horizon does not seem to be going well. Meta has never been able to create, ironically, a good VR social space or fund one, really. And if that's the basket that they're putting all their eggs in, I think that's a pretty dangerous one. If what they want to yeah. do is make the best VR headset, I'm much more bullish on that. Yeah, 100 percent agree. Cool. Well, Adi, thank you so much for hopping on with us today. I love getting the chance to talk to you about all this stuff. You really know uh, everything uh, you know about about VR tech, and uh, it make, it honestly it makes me excited to hear what is on the on the horizon. No pun intended. Uh, Adi Robertson, of course, uh, writes for The Verge. If people want to follow you online, where can they find you? I am at theverge.com, and I'm Twitter at the Dextriarchy. Right on. Thank you so much, and we'll uh, talk to you again soon. Take care. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye. All right. Coming up, uh, Ant's story of the week. That's right around the corner. Actually, you know, again, there, there's like a, a little bit of a theme in today's show about kind of like virtualized, uh, you know, presentations and stuff. We're going to talk a little bit about Project Starline, which mm -hmm. I think is fascinating. So I'm happy that you picked that, Ant. Uh, but... First, let's take a moment to thank the sponsor of this episode of Tech News Weekly, and that is Nureva. Today's IT pros are in a tough spot, no question about it. The shift to hybrid working and hybrid learning means that they have to equip and support uh, more spaces with audio and video conferencing systems, right? And at the same time, they're busier than ever with their network security, the shift to cloud-based solutions, infrastructure issues, all these things, and so much more. These factors, along with product shortages and even delays, have put an unprecedented strain on IT resources. Uh, you know, people, time, expertise, budgets, it's all impacted. This has driven customers to demand intelligent products that require minimal effort from IT to deploy and manage at scale with the bonus of requiring zero end user training. Seems like a lot to ask, right? When it comes to audio conferencing in larger spaces, it's common to be faced with multi-component systems. They're complicated, that's costly to design, costly to install, you know, complicated to maintain and manage all the things. Well, Nureva is changing that by offering solutions that deliver a high level of simplicity. With Nureva, you get true full room mic pickup from just one or two microphone and speaker bars. You can actually compare that to the complicated maze of multiple mics, speakers, amps, DSPs, switchers, and other components that are required in a traditional system. Well, in this case, you can install a Nureva system in most spaces in less than 30 minutes. It's super easy. For larger spaces, it may take 60 minutes. Why? Because you might use two bars instead of one. It's amazingly simple, 
No special expertise is required. And you know, you compare that with installations for traditional systems, they could take your rooms offline for days because they're so complicated. And some traditional systems may require you to go from room to room and use complicated software. Well, with Nareva, you can monitor, you can manage, update, and adjust all your Nareva systems from a powerful cloud-based platform called Nareva Console. Make it easy. Nareva is very scalable for large organizations, and their systems cost a fraction of traditional systems. And now, actually, you can get 50% off. That's 5-0. 50% off one Nareva HDL 300 system for mid-sized rooms when you get a live online demo and when you buy before December 16th, 2022. So you've got some time. You've got a couple of months. Visit Nareva.com slash twit. That's N-U-R-E-V-A. Nareva.com slash twit. And check it out for yourself. And we thank Nareva for their support of Tech News Weekly. All right, Ant, over to you. Okay, so Mr. Howell, you are clearly a lot more bullish on this story than I am, um, but I do find it interesting. And we're talking about Google and their Starline project. Uh, they, they introduced this back at 2021 uh, at Google I.O. And as mentioned here on The Verge, uh, this, this project seems to be the real deal. Well, what exactly is it? It is essentially another way of doing a um, teleconference or a one-on-one -on -one virtual chat, but it's going to be way more immersive and way more of a real life experience, basically because of all of the extra bells and whistles and technologies in place that allows you to look at the person you're speaking to and feel like they're literally in the room with you. This isn't just holding up your phone and having FaceTime. This isn't just having a big screen for a Zoom meeting. This is a really, really big piece of equipment with a gazillion sensors all over it and lenses to help give you a, a much more immersive and real world uh, experience with this. Looks good. Sounds good. I'm not saying I have a lot of confidence in all of this, Mr. Howell, uh, because, all right, so let's, let's, let's look at some scenarios of where this can be used. Think about mm. enterprise um, offices, big offices, uh, such as the offices that they're planning to roll this out to, like Salesforce, WeWork, big companies. They want to, they're wanting to have a, a, a meeting with someone on the other side of the country, fine and dandy. Instead of pulling up Zoom, they can pull this up. Does this really make that experience any better? Because it looks like you can talk directly to the CEO um, over a better bit of resolution. Is this really going to make that deal go through in their negotiations? I don't see it. I see this as a big money suck because you're going to have to buy a lot of extra equipment. You're going to have to have a dedicated space for this to work in. You can't just flop down into a conference room and, and, and set this up. Uh, this is literally a big old booth and room that's dedicated to this type of technology. I'm not thrilled with that. Oh, and by the way, this is Google, who has a huge graveyard of things that they uh, have their ADD moments on and just kill it mm -hmm. because, oh, yeah, we forgot about that. <coughs> so, yeah. <laughs> also known as Google Stadia. <laughs> oh, I mean, and, and 500,000 other products. Yeah, Stadia is just the latest one. You know, yeah. I saw the story and it, and it, it was captivating because, again, the, the pandemic really made us shift as, as, as a people. You know, we we saw the the explosion of Zoom and and other teleconferencing technology, and it has definitely gotten better. It has made things easier for a lot of us, uh, including content creators like ourselves, where we can do these things remote and still have a, a great quality experience for for us as hosts, as well as our listeners and viewers. I don't see something like this being necessary and that useful. Just a bit of cool tech that says, hey, this tech is going to get better. But I, I don't know. Your thoughts? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So am I bullish on this idea? I'm, I'm excited about the I, I'm excited about the idea. Am I excited about it as a Google product? No, because you know, <laughs> based on what you've said, what you've pointed out, right? And this is just the this is the unfortunate place where I think a lot of people um, who follow this stuff regularly are with Google. Is that Google has really great ideas? They have zero like ability to stay with those ideas, or rather, launch an idea that they're willing to commit to very long term. Everything feels like it's walking a tightrope, and it could fall off at any moment. And so I see something like this, and I love the idea of it. 
it. Like I, right now, you know, just to kind of pull the curtain back a little bit, I'm mm-hmm. sitting in my friend's office and he has what I'm guessing to be a 55 inch TV mounted to the wall behind here. He uses it for programming, very high resolution. You know, yeah. I've got my Zoom uh, return video feed is like a, a, a window this big above my webcam, which is sitting in front of this gigantic monitor. Would I rather be looking at you in this monitor and have, and the way Project Starline works, you know, it really is like this three dimensional light field type experience where I'm looking at you directly in your eyes and you're looking at me directly in my eyes and it's, and it's big enough to be real. It's big enough that I'm looking at a real size version of Ant on the other side. I would love that. That would be so amazing. And I do actually, you know, you you um, spelled out the example of like, you know, meeting with a CEO to get that job done or get that deal made. And I guess the question that I have there is, would you say that it's easier for you to get that deal made if you're in person versus on a Zoom window? And I would say yes. It's, you're probably mm-hmm. going to have better chances getting that mm-hmm. deal made in person than you are on Zoom. So then, if there's a technology that makes not in person still look like in person, and from what I understand about this technology is that it's so convincing that you really do feel like you're sitting at a table with someone, mm-hmm. then I think the chances are more. Like, no, it's not going to be the only reason that that deal gets made, but probably better than you know a, a Zoom window and, and might be mm-hmm. a whole lot less expensive barring the expense of the technology, I realize, but then flying out, you know, to, to do these things as well. Mm-hmm. So I like the idea of it, but it is Google we're talking about. Google has pointed out that this is not a, this is not a product that they're selling. They are really in the R and D right. phase on this. They're, they're rolling it out, you know, and, and inviting some partners in to test it. I think we work is a really great, um, a great deal, like something along those lines, because then if people, you know, if I'm a, if I'm looking for office space, like WeWork might be a great satellite place to go when I want to have these kind of conversations. Oh, just go to your WeWork. I'll go there too. And we'll be in the same room instead of on other sides of the, of the planet. I think that's pretty cool. Well, do you not think we're getting pretty close to this nowadays with the tech that we have in place? Because I'm speaking to you through a cinema camera right now and yeah. with ideal connectivity, I'm sure it looks pretty daggum good because my return feed of it, I I could just touch myself right now. It, it, it's it's pretty. Mm-hmm. And you put that onto a large screen um, for your Zoom box, whether it be a, a, a laptop or what have you, just connect that up to a large screen. You're still going to get a very nice display of the person you're speaking to. Um, I don't think you need to set up a huge box. Uh, if someone, if everybody mm-hmm. has, legit equipment like a nice camera with that that's able to shoot at a with a nice soft depth of field heck even the stuff that mr laporte's been using this week with um the twit news those cameras look great and those were little tiny one inch sensors and it he looked yeah. really really good and that he didn't have to spend a gazillion dollars and have all of these extra sensors and things like that he didn't have to worry about doing chroma keying because that's another thing that this technology is going to do because you're not going to have people with bald heads like me it's easy to chroma key around me but people that have a lot of hair you get to see all of the mm. little artifacts and stuff like that you know it yep. i don't know it, uh, i'm yeah. sorry i don't mean to poo poo all over it you don't need to be sorry <laughs> no i th- i think it's i think it's uh, totally valid right like what we have right now and what we've we've learned a new skill i think in the last couple of years the pandemic mm-hmm. forced us all to get comfortable with video chat and, mm-hmm. and I think before the pandemic, I'd say the majority of people who video chat now were not comfortable with it. There were a lot of people that yeah. did it and they were ahead of the curve, but now everybody has been exposed to it. They might not like it, but mm-hmm. they're a lot more used to it, a lot more comfortable with it. So so it's kind of like our experience, it, it fills in the gaps. It fills in the gaps of, of my video chat with you. You know, I, I'm able to kind of block out the fact that connectivity is not always perfect and sometimes there's blips. I'm able to you know, tune out the mm-hmm. fact that when I'm talking to you, um, actually, you're really good at looking at the camera, but when you're looking at the camera, you're not looking at me, so it's not true eye contact. You know what I mean? And so you talk to some yeah, people and yeah. the whole time you're talking to them, they're looking off the side like this. And so we <laughs> fill in the gaps for that. Yeah. We make you know, we, we make corrections in our mind um, for that. It's better than we had before. I'm just saying this really is kind of the next level of that, right? It gives yeah. you a three-dimensional 
life-size kind of re, uh, recreation. By the way, it's not a it's not really a camera. It's recreating you. Recreating it's a computer it, yeah. that, that recreates in 3D your image, your likeness um, to make it seem like you know you're there and. Yeah, I don't know how necessary it is, but I know it's cool. I know, like, I know I would love to check it out, and I wonder if this is just the beginning point for really great technology where the price is a lot lower and it does something similar to this ten years from now. And if that's the case, I'm all for it. And and, and again, I can appreciate what they're saying far as making it look better. Um, mm-hmm. I've had a couple pitches here recently locally with with some people for for business and. It definitely makes a difference that they're looking at me with nice lighting yeah. and nice camera and stuff like that because they always comment on it and it will take me way more seriously than just me staring at it through the, one of these weird um, webcam things, you know. So I, yeah. I get where yeah. Google is coming from on that. But at the same time, I'm just trying to think a little bit more practical about it, thinking about the the, the enterprise offices, thinking about the WeWorks, thinking about um, Salesforce or what have you. and it, is it going to make any sense practically there or could they just beef up their existing 50 inch TV like what you have there in your friend's office and stuff like that or yeah. put in some additional speakers, you know, because that goes a long way. Like we just talked about Naraver, one of our sponsors, having stuff like that makes a big mm-hmm. difference, you know, it does. It does. Yeah, I will be really curious to see if Google sticks to this technology and yes. you know, like we like we said, you know, it's, cross your fingers, and you, know, you still have no assurances anymore as far as what Google's going to do that with. But if they do, and there's no question, this is in, incredibly expensive technology right now. Like, I'm, I'm really curious to see, like, as they develop it out further, like, who who is who is the uh, the customer for a, a product like this? And I mean, it really feels like the enterprise is probably the right place for something like this. I don't I don't think this technology gets a whole lot cheaper anytime soon. So, but but you know, trialing this thing in places like Salesforce, in WeWork, mm-hmm. I guess that's a good way for for workers, for the people on the other side to see like what kind of work are we able to get done when we have the ability to do this? Because we haven't had the ability to do this, not to this level. I, I do think that there is something to be said for interpersonal connection where we can look into each other's eyes. And that's what this really enables. It enables, it, it's, it's so real from what I understand that it tricks your mind into thinking that it's like real, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, yeah. and there's value there. I know when I talk with someone mm-hmm. in, real, in real life, like there's an emotional connection that you can get. Yep. By looking in someone's eyes and that's what i wonder about this does that create a next layer a next level of of communication satisfaction let's say uh yeah. if we have to be virtual that we don't get from current systems i would guess that it probably does i just don't know if the costs justify justify yep. it that's the thing that's the thing is it justifiable yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I guess we'll see. But the technology is super cool. And I hope that someday I get to check this out. If it means that I have to go to a WeWork and, uh, you know, call somebody else at a WeWork, I'm totally down. <laughs> I'm down for the uh, for the uh, field trip. I will do it. <laughs> so. All right. Well, we have reached the end of this episode of Tech News Weekly. And, Ant, thank you so much for uh, filling in for Micah while he is out. I love getting the chance to do shows with you. And I don't get a whole lot of opportunities to do that. So thanks for uh, dropping in for Micah this week. Hey, my pleasure. My pleasure. I appreciate you having me and and tolerating me as I try to fight through the wonderful tech news of the week. (laughs) You did amazing, as you always do. Uh, Tech News Weekly, we publish this show every Thursday at twit.tv slash TNW. That's where you can go to subscribe to the show in audio and video formats. And can tell you all about Club Twit, though, because he's the Club Twit man. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I am the Club Twit Community Manager. If you want to get access to all of our Twit content ad-free, join Club Twit for just $7 a month. You can go to twit.tv slash 
Club Twit and sign up. And when you sign up for Club Twit, not only do you get ad free versions of all of our shows, you get access to some of our shows that aren't public yet. You know, we have hands on Mac. We have hands on Windows there uh, hosted by both Mr. Michael Sargent and uh, Mr. Paul Therott. There's also a little fireside chats and Stacy's book club and a lot of just fun stuff inside of our discord. I think that's the main thing people really dig about Club Twit. So go ahead and sign up twit.tv slash Club Twit and uh, join today, folks. And if you want to give me a follow over on social media, you can find me on Twitter. I am Ant underscore Pruitt there. Love chatting with all of you folks there. Right on. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find me as well at Jason Howell. Um, I will be returning after a couple of weeks off from uh, All About Android. I'll be returning next week. It turned out the two weeks that I was off were like the two most consequential Android weeks of the year. So that was not planned crazy so i so i feel really behind as far as understanding and where the you know the pixel 7 pro and, and the pixel watch and all those things are right now but i will be joining next tuesday so uh twit.tv slash aaa uh to catch me on all about android next week big thanks to john ashley thanks to burke everyone behind the scenes helping us do this show each and every week thanks again to you and and thanks to you for watching and listening we'll see you all next time next thursday on tech news weekly Bye, everybody. Take care, everyone. Hey there, I'm Micah Sargent. Look, as a geek myself, I feel it's only fair if I admit something. We can be kind of hard to shop for. So what do you get for that geek in your life who has everything already? Well, a Club Twit gift subscription, of course. Twit podcasts keep them informed and entertained with the most relevant tech news podcasts available. With a Club Twit subscription, they're going to get access to all of our podcasts ad free exclusive outtakes, behind the scenes and special content, and I love this, exclusive shows like my own Hands on Mac and Hands on Windows from Paul Therott, as well as the Untitled Linux Show. So purchase your geek's gift at twit.tv slash clubtwit, and they will thank you every day.